Well, uh, everyone, I think we should get started. Um, I am Chet Kerr, one of the board members of the Historical Irvington Historical Society, and I want to welcome you to today's presentation by RW250 President Connie Kehoe's entitled Westchester's Revolutionary War Places. I'm especially pleased that today's presentation is being co-sponsored by the Irvington Public Library, the Dobbs Ferry Public Library, the Warner Library, the Dobbs Ferry Historical Society, and the Historical Society of Sleepy Hollow and Terrytown. Our working together reflects the broad interest in our shared revolutionary era history as we approach the 250th anniversary of this important moment in our country's history. A couple of logistical things, this session is being recorded. Um, we will hopefully be able to put it up on the Irvington Historical Society website in a couple of days for those of you who have to step off in the middle. There will also be a question and answer session at the end. Um, if as, the, as you go along, you have questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, or at the end, during the question and answer session, you can put your questions in the chat and we'll try to go through them. And to the extent Connie can, she'll try to answer them for you uh, during the presentation. So today's presentation about Revolutionary War Place is especially relevant to the history of the river towns, largely because this history unfolded in the very places where we walk and live every day. For example, not more than a half a mile away from where I'm sitting today is the original Odell Tavern, which is not only the oldest structure in the village of Irvington, but which played a key role during the revolution. It was at one point the meeting place of the New York Committee of Safety, which was planning with uh, George Washington, the Continental Army's strategic retreat from Brooklyn up to White Plains. And in addition, for a period of time during the war, General Vaughn of the British Army was encamped on Odell's Hill, the high ground just to the Northwest of the Odell Tavern. Uh, we're especially lucky today to have as our presenter, Connie Kehoe. Connie majored in history in college and used that interest in a long and highly successful career in, in teaching and education. And in her role as trustee and deputy mayor uh, here in Irvington for many years, she long championed initiatives to preserve and promote the historical character of our village and the wider historic valley, Hudson Valley, excuse me. In 2018, she became the president and a director of Revolutionary War 250 to build an awareness and understanding of the events, places, people, and ideas of the Revolutionary War period here in Westchester. She has been a tireless advocate and a leader of RW250's goals to create a wider understanding and appreciation of the Revolutionary War period and what that history can tell us today. So please join me in welcoming Connie. Thank you, Chet. Thank you, thank you. That was a very <laughs> generous introduction. Um, I share your thanks to the co-sponsors and this is my hometown. Uh, so I'm especially pleased uh, to be able to uh, give this presentation to all of you today who could be from anywhere, foreign countries and across Westchester. So um, I could spend about 10 minutes thanking people but everybody would be annoyed. So you know out there who you are and thank you so much for all the help you have given uh, me and others to bring this awareness to the public. So uh, jumping right in, um, the Revolutionary War in Westchester County, you see the whole span of years, 1776 to 1783 there, and that's just to bring it home to everybody that it wasn't just um, a quick battle once and everything was over until the evacuation. There were events, people, places, uh, things going on the entire almost eight years of the war right here in our, our broader backyard. So uh, we're gonna do quite a, 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 a sprint uh, across the county um, in this, uh, presentation today. So uh, I did want to make sure uh, we gave credit to Dr. Eric Weiselberg. He is the principal historian of RW250. And 
we started collaborating and he, he showed me, you know, early on, he started putting stars on different places that connected to the revolution right here. And I mean, this isn't even complete. I think our latest list is something like 53 different places. So um, obviously, you know, we need volume two, three, and four to cover this, but um, we will cover as much as we can uh, for you guys today. I think it'll take about 40, 45 minutes. And then at the very end, I have some slides about what revolutionary Westchester actually does. And we've been doing um, activities and events since 2018. So a little context. Uh, the most local of you know the geography, but uh, bear with me as I explain that Westchester County here has the Hudson River uh, here on the west and Long Island Sound on the right. You can see Connecticut here. I show this slide uh, really to provide a context for places as I discuss this. Um, and part of it is because you, we need to understand uh, how much geography affected what was going on uh, in Westchester. Very, very critical. Most historians and many of the contemporaries believe that the control of the Hudson River for either the British or the Patriots um, could determine uh, the outcome of the war. So where are we? Um, the term neutral ground, Everybody knew at the time, and we all now know, it wasn't neutral, it was contested. In other words, no side controlled it for much of the war. But let's look at the dotted line at the bottom, the black dotted line. You see Kingsbridge, uh, that uh, section where my cursor is near, that's Manhattan from uh, essentially day one of the war the British were controlling Manhattan and that general area. So that's Kingsbridge. Um, there's a lot to say about Kingsbridge, but this line, this black dotted line is what I'm essentially uh, putting forth as where the British were really in control. Um, then we'll go up north. Um, this is little red line. There's so much about the Croton River this is the Croton River, it goes on and on and on here. But in the revolution, you hear a lot of references here, see, read about the Croton River. Um, and up here is Peekskill. Now this red dotted line is what I essentially uh, am, am, am putting forth as above that, if you were supporting the, the cause as, uh, Richard Ellis and many people call this conflict, um, that you would be more safe. You could move, you could move there. Your family could move there. You could send your, your family there. And if you were a loyalist, um, a supporter of the British, you were also called a refugee. <laughs> um, if you were a local who moved out of this area down towards the area, the, the the, um, the British control. Uh, we got this little uh, schema from East Chester and uh, there's a lot to say about East Chester and much of it I have left out of the, this uh, episode of this series that I think will develop of places in Westchester. All right, so Let's just take the very first year. Everybody knows 1776, you know about the Declaration of Independence. We'll talk about the one conventional battle, the really big conventional battle that happened in Westchester that year here. Uh, so what do we have here? All right, so we have the Declaration of Independence, but over here on the right, you see I have July 9th. Now people think of July 4th as our holiday. Many people know most of it was written on July 2nd in Philadelphia. But the story about New York, which again can be a whole talk. I actually did a big talk about this last July 4th. I was really honored to be asked to go to Mount Vernon, New York Mount, and um, speak at their uh, national heritage site at St. Paul's with the mayor 
and others. And I talked about this because it was July 4th. So in New York, I'll just get this story uh, quickly out. Uh, there were delegates in Philadelphia who were not given the power to make the decision about saying yes or no to signing on to the declaration. So a copy had to be sent up to White Plains and a group of uh, uh, Congress was called the Fourth Provincial Congress was in the courthouse in White Plains. They had to approve it before it was approved in Philadelphia. So you can imagine the horses going back and forth. But they met uh, July 9th and they approved it up here in White Plains. Uh, I just think it would have been very cool experience to be there um, because when they made these broadsides, these papers of which there were about 500 and it's a really great story. There are only about five of these left and Westchester County in their archives has one of them preserved, you know, almost 250 years ago. So to me, when that broadside said state of New York instead of colony of New York, you know, just imagine standing there. Okay, so in the 19th century, you know, artists always imagine what something was like. We know they're usually pretty far from accurate, but uh, take it for what it, what it is. Uh, this painting shows that courthouse or the imagined courthouse, which is probably fairly close, the building. And um, reading it is John Thomas and the Thomas family it was, from the area where Purchase College is now. And he was reading this to the gathered uh, crowd and they were hearing that we were now um, declaring our independence and they obviously realized, you know, that it wasn't gonna be an easy few years coming, coming up. So what you can see today, because this is a, a talk about places, you can go, uh, so it's Broadway and Mitchell Place in White Plains. So you're probably driven by there. Um, that's private property essentially now. It's called the Armory. It's not the courthouse, but there is this um, uh, monument uh, to that event. And we call White Plains the birthplace of the state of New York. Huzzah. <laughs> All right. So 17, we're still in 1776. We won't stay there very long, but um, that battle, the Battle of White Plains, uh, you didn't know there was photography then, did you? <laughs> well, on the left, this is um, a major um, recreation of that battle by reenactors in 2001. These reenactments are big, big deals. It's hundreds and hundreds of people. This was in Ward, Pound Ridge Reservation. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that, but I pair this with on the right, um, this is St. Paul's Church in Mount Vernon, our Mount Vernon. And I pair these two because in order to understand in my view, the Battle of White Plains, you need to understand the Battle of Pell's Point, much less known but it was about a mile away from this church, uh, which wasn't completed at the time. There wasn't a name Mount Vernon, it was Eastchester, it was the Eastchester Green. But um, that, that site uh, now has the best uh, walks and talks, in my opinion, about the Battle of Pell's Point. So let me give you a tiny bit about that. So we're in Southern Westchester now, we're closer to the, to the British, um, controlled area and the British were coming up following uh, Washington as he was retreating from his big defeat, the Battle of uh, Brooklyn or the Battle of Long Island. And they, um, they come up and uh, believe they can attack from Long Island Sound um, over here. And they do, their ships land and what's gonna happen? Well, uh, Colonel Glover um, had a small contingent of his, um, I think they're called the Marbleheaders. He was, he was an incredible leader and Washington really uh, admired him. 
but he slowed the British down at Pell's Point. Now this is Pelham Bay Park, and you know everybody now says this rock and this marker in the wrong place. It's not really the place where it should be. And if you go on the tour, you'll end up in Split Rock Golf Course, where you can really see some of the um, the, the the stone fences that give you a, a sense of what that um, kind of delaying tactic was. Uh, but many of the Hessians, the Hessians were auxiliary troops who fought with the British. Uh, there are quite a few of them who were brought that mile away to that church that wasn't even finished being built, didn't have a roof yet, but that became a hospital. And there are grave sites for some of those casualties from that Battle of Pell's Point. Okay, now moving north to White Plains. Again, you love these 19th century paintings, but it does give you a sense. So many of you have probably heard in White Plains, um, if you've read anything about this or seen anything on PBS that probably mentioned Chatterton Hill. So this is a, um, again, kind of, kind of imagined view of the Patriots in blue moving their artillery up to the top of Chatterton Hill. Um, then you see the Bronx River over here. Um, no Bronx River Parkway, but you see a lot of little red stick figures and that's the British and their Hessian um, auxiliary troops. And, you know, this would be an hour talk that military folks could give you about this, but I'm just going to do a quick summary to say that there were several um, uh, attempts by the British to take this hill, which was considered the most strategic strategic place in White Plains. And on the third time they were successful and the Patriots were pushed off of the hill. So the analysis of this in the history books is often, okay, Washington was defeated. Well, there's another view of this in that um, the British did not take advantage of this win and didn't follow Washington. And therefore, Washington was able to keep his army intact and move on. So here are some of the things that you can go to. You can go to Chatterton Hill. It's called Battle Hill Park. There's a neighborhood up there. It's a little park um, in White Plains. You can also go to the Purdy House almost every year, um, except maybe one during COVID. They uh, recreate um, a ceremony, you know, recognizing the, um, the Battle of White Plains. This is uh, run by the White Plains Historical Society. This is an interior shot that can, there are often, well, I'm not going to say often, but there are tours of this. Uh, you really get a feel for these uh, farmhouses, these tenant farmhouses. This is one of them. And here's another one. This is the Miller House, also in White Plains. Well, it's actually North White Plains, which is actually uh, North Castle. Um, so, uh, however, um, it's, it is open to the public uh, on certain times. It is taken over by the County of Westchester, thankfully, as it was falling apart. Um, uh, actually, when, uh, County Executive George Latimer came in. This was um, a project of his that he got full support. He financed that or we financed it as taxpayers. And there's also a little visitor center here. So I, I think as we go towards, as Chet mentioned, 2026 is the 250th. I would like to see more and more events at both of these places because to me place, it just gives you a feel for it. Um, at least for me, if you're there and you kind of imagine what it was like, you look at the geography, there's a Miller Hill, there's a, there's, there's, um, uh, there's the, the place called, uh, what is it called? Mis uh, Mount, Mount, Misery. Mount Misery, Mount Misery, yes. And that's a little park, I think it could be rehabilitated. So both of these places, if you're writing down, hey, where should I go? You know, Purdy House, Miller House, both great places. Here's an interior shot. 
And <clears throat> now, now we really go north. Washington retreated, as I said, he's, I'm going to say he slipped away, but that's probably not accurate if you were a military person listening to me. But he had to cross out of Westchester, and he did so at this place called Stony Point for Planks Point. Um, Westchester's here on the right, and you're going across to um, what is still New York, but the, the other side of the river. This is uh, Stony Point, uh, which is a also a battle, uh, preserved battle area. And uh, Washington was able from here to make his way down to the Delaware River near Trenton. And I think you know the story about where he crossed another river and which gets a lot of uh, press, shall we say, crossing the Delaware. So that was a success for the Patriots following this uh, I call it a strategic retreat that Washington was able to pull off because of this safe crossing area. Now, what is it like now? Okay, I'm gonna tell you, this is one of my favorites. I'm not supposed to have favorites, but this is a place, if you haven't gone here and many people haven't, you can get a sense of um, the river without the train and you can get a feel for how close the other side of the rivers here. So you have to imagine it's not just, um, you know, a few boats going across. You've got artillery, you've got horses, you've got supplies, all of that Washington has to get across the river, and he does. Uh, there are, and we're going to get back to this because that's not the only time where Plank's point is um, important. Uh, now I'm going to try to remember. We've made five videos of places in Westchester, and this is one of them. All right, so moving out of that year, 1776, we're now gonna look at just some of those um, events that happened when I said it was neutral ground, ha ha. It was, it was raids, it was skirmishes, it was burning individual houses, it was attacking for revenge, it was arguments between what had been neighbors and one was a loyalist now and one was a, um, a, a patriot or a continental and it was devastation. Um, the, the, I just can't imagine um, what it was like for the, for the loosely or for the very lightly um, a populated area, mostly, of farms and small villages. This was almost eight years of devastation. Now, things, some of things are open to the public um, that were there at the time and were devastated. Some of the wealthy, some of the poor. Um, it, it was shared um, across the county. So this is, you probably know it, um, Van Cortland Manor, it's up near Croton River where the Croton River it reaches the Hudson. And it is, um, you know, an, a place that is open to the public and the Van Cortlands were patriots and they were in the North, but even, and they were very wealthy, very wealthy landowners. Um, they, um, they suffered too in that they're, uh, this this building here, this manor house, was raided by the British, um, and uh, has it took years and years and years to be repaired. Um, I'm pairing some of these um, points mostly to say places that are open to the public, but um, there were many others. This is a, a parallel but different story. The other well, shall we say, one of the other very large landowners in Westchester before the war is the Phillips family. And, and this is Phillips Manor Hall in Yonkers. Um, these two very wealthy, um, both who owned enslaved Africans and wealth uh, 
built, part of their wealth was obviously built on the toil of those enslaved Africans. Uh, here we have Pierre Van Cortland, who sided with the Patriots from day one. And here we have Frederick Phillips III. Um, for the events that happened after the war, just imagine Phillips, Frederick Phillips has his land, his 52,000 acres from Spite and Dival all the way up to the near the Croton River, that's confiscated and it becomes able to be purchased first by the tenant farmers who were having to give part of their farm produce to the Lord of the Manor. Well, that revolution changed things um, and they could then, if they were able, purchase the land. Uh, Pierre Van Cortland kept his property. He was, shall we say, on the winning side. So that's only one little part of the stories of obviously civilians, um, everyday people, women, men, children, enslaved, free, uh, they suffered greatly. Uh, <clears throat> one example is burning a whole town. So this is the burning of Bedford. <clears throat> Bedford and Pound Ridge were attacked twice um, during these years of devastation. Bannister Tarleton, if you read about him, he's considered quite a vicious guy, uh, this British uh, officer. He came up to uh, Bedford um, and was looking for a militia unit, uh, wasn't happy, got shot at, he lost some guys and he came. Then another uh, British group came up 10 days later and they burned the entire place, I kind of say in retribution. Um, except for one loyalist home that was saved. Now, what can you see? Well, not every year, but frequently, the various uh, historic groups in uh, Bedford do a really um, interesting educational day. And you can see all the people. Uh, this was 2019, I guess, um, when I went for the first time. But they recreate this, and there's a lot of uh, soak in the, the history of this. Uh, now, another area, this is not Bedford. You can, before I tell you the place, you can try to guess if you want to look at the geography. This was a foraging party of British coming up from um, the south. Uh, they were mostly um, Hessians. Uh, mounted Hessians and some infantry, and the Patriots who are actually in these, you know, you wonder how they don't get mixed up with these uniforms, but the green and buff are the Patriots and the green and red are the Hessians. Uh, the, the Patriots got a uh, tip that they were coming on this um, foraging raid. And I guess I should say the obvious that the whole army in New York City needed food for themselves. They needed um, for their horses. They needed equipment. They needed fuel. And coming up to most New Jersey and to Westchester was what what a foraging party did. Uh, this was called a harvest forge. It was in September. Well, they. Um, they, they, they retreated, uh, there were many prisoners. And I, if, you, if you wrote down where you think this is, I'll now reveal it. <laughs> this is Hastings, our Hastings on Hudson. You see the Palisades and you see the Hudson River here. Um, I'm gonna show you what you can see. Um, these are the a new plaza on Route 9 Broadway. Actually, at this very moment, they had some trouble with uh, um, ponding of water that wasn't, um, it was, so they, I don't think you can physically see these right now, but uh, this was in um, this fall when they were revealed and uh, with several speakers and our, our historian, Eric Weiselberg did a great deal of the research so that I'll show you here. Um, when you can, when they are set back up on this plaza, you'll be able to see that instead of just a little plaque that said something happened here, you get the context. 
you get background, you see a timeline. I, I think because they're so beautifully done, look at the artwork here. Um, this is John uh, Wright and his, um, he's made beautiful dioramas as well. But I think this is a good way to go to a place, soak it up and learn something. Um, there were lots of kids there, lots of folks um, on the day it was opened up. Now, that ended that particular skirmish. When 500 people fight, I don't know why you call it a skirmish. I think it's a pretty serious event. But uh, up in Yorktown Heights, so you're going north in Westchester. This is another very evocative um, monument that can bring you back if you kind of close your eyes and imagine um, a, an event that happened there. It was um, the road, uh, well, let me give you a little background. The Rhode Island Regiment was, um, came obviously came from Rhode Island. They were part of the Continental Army, but they were serving um, in 1780 here in Westchester. Uh, and in, in, in what's now Yorktown. And they, uh, that unit, that regiment was uh, recruited from mostly about two thirds uh, soldiers who were of African descent. And if they were enslaved and they agreed to serve and served out their term, they, their, their, they, their freedom had been purchased from their owners in Rhode Island. So there were, um, there were two thirds of the members of this regiment uh, were African-American. There were indigenous people as well. Was the, um, was the officer, um, you know, you see him here. He's, he's, not, he's not a person of color. The officers were white and what happened in Westchester, um, and there's not much to see at the actual place. It's called the Battle of Pines Bridge. Um, there was a bridge um, in the area across the Croton River, but what happened was the, the refugees, the Lancey's refugees, you can read about them uh, if you don't know about them. They, they had once lived you know, across Westchester, but they stayed loyal to the British and they knew the terrain. They snuck around on an unguarded area and at a dawn uh, one morning, uh, they attacked the headquarters um, and did more than just have a battle. There was basically a, a massacre of people who were trying to, soldiers who were trying to say they were, um, you know, giving up. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty uh, sad tale of this, but they, that regiment also went to the Battle of Yorktown and they, they were a very, very effective fighting unit. Oh yeah, so this is Dwayne, Dwayne, Dwayne Jackson. Um, I, uh, Jay, Dwayne does great presentations um, in, you know, for, for kids and others about the Rhode Island Regiment. Uh, so this is when I met him the first time. Uh, now, changing gears, when it's devastation for everybody in an area, it's devastation for people who are starting, they're trying to stay out of this conflict. So this is the Quaker Meeting House in Chappaqua. Um, Ray Williams has really told me so much about this and he, he took me and Kevin, uh, my husband, who's over there, <laughs> um, took us through the meeting house. It's not normally open to the public, but there is in the back a graveyard um, and uh, very, very evocative of the, the feel for what happened here. Um, as I understand it, quite a few of the um, wounded soldiers uh, were, all, were brought here after the Battle of White Plains. And the property of these folks who was, they were just trying to stay out of it um, as, as a religious tenant to not uh, be involved in, in the killing or taking of human life. They got pulled into with this devastation too. All right, switching gears, um, chapter three, I guess we call this. 
the traitor, the spy, and the captors. And I, if you're in Terrytown, you know where this story is going, right? <laughs> um, so who's the traitor? Who's the spy? Who are the captors? And what happened here in Westchester in 1780? All right, here we go. West Point works into this. West Point is about 15 miles north of the top of Westchester County on the quote North River. You probably all know that the Hudson River was called the North River. It was also called the river that flows both ways by the native people. But um, West Point was considered an incredibly important strategic fort in the, the Hudson Highlands and Whoever controlled that um, could easily control the whole uh, strategy of the war. So who was the general in charge of West Point in 1780? Well, here he is, Benedict Arnold. So uh, again, this is like a three hour talk, but I'll just go really quickly through this because you can visit West Point, of course, uh, but <clears throat> Benedict Arnold, um, at this point in the war, was very disenchanted. He was angry. He felt he hadn't been recognized by Washington. There had been a few court martials, but he he was, and he 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 always will be remembered as one of the heroes of the Battle of Saratoga and several other important military accomplishments. But he made the decision um, to go to the other side. And he colluded with this guy on the left, young, handsome, talented, poet, artist, spy, Major John Andre. And uh, Major John Andre uh, and Benedict Arnold had communicated for quite a bit of time and they were ready to meet in person to for, for the British to get the plans of the fortifications around West Point where the, where the troops were and make it possible for them to easily take West Point. That was the plan. Okay, so there's um, a little drawing of made by uh, Arnold uh, by Andre of the little boat he was taken in when he left the ship called the Vulture that had come up the Hudson. So he's meeting uh, Benedict Arnold um, and he's meeting on the other side of the Hudson, what I'm going to call the New Jersey side. Um, that part is still in New York. Um, <clears throat> and they talk through the night, but lo and behold, the vulture gets fired upon and pulls anchor and moves a bit away. And now Andre has no ship to get back with his plans. He's, they've made the deal on uh, Benedict Arnold's gonna get X number of pounds reward and he's gonna be a general and he's gonna be this and he's gonna get a pension and his wife is gonna get a son anyway. So, but now Andre is stuck. So this again, another imaginary situation, something like this probably happened. Arnold is saying, take what I have in my left hand. These are the six pieces of paper with the plans and the information that are gonna give the British what they want. Put it inside your boot, take off your uniform, put on civilian clothes and good luck. <laughs> um, he was, taken across to the Westchester side and given a horse and a companion. And he was supposed to make his way back to New York City and deliver these plans. Well, let's see how that turned out. Um, oh yes, he was given a pass. He's now John Anderson. And Benedict Arnold said, John Anderson can go to White Plains and go back. He's, he's, he's with me, he's on business. Well. Okay, one of those Courier and I imagine what happened in Terrytown. Um, these are the three uh, militiamen who were on a mission from their commanding officer that day, especially to be looking for cattle thieves. Um, 
and they uh, there were seven, eight, nine of them originally, and they were put in different spots to do this uh, on that particular day in September. And along comes this guy on a horse. And one thing after another happened, but um, they were suspicious of him. They, um, they, he offered them bribes. They said, no, they, uh, they eventually searched him. They found the pieces of paper, very incriminating. And um, I think it's really interesting that only one of them can read. John, John Paulding could read and he was able to look at those papers. Um, I think I have one of them, yeah, here where it's telling you there are X number of soldiers here from Colonel Lamb's regiment. I mean, it was everything they needed to know to be prepared. So what happened? Well, Andre uh, was hanged as a spy. He had a trial. Um, he was hanged in Tapan, New York. Many of you have probably been over there. Um, and he, Holding and Van Wart and Williams, the three militiamen were honored. They got, um, they got uh, medals, they got commendations, they eventually got land, um, they got a pension um, and they got a statue. Uh, well, Paulding got a statue in uh, Patriots Park. Uh, there was originally like the one on the left and then um, at the hundredth, year celebration. Here's what happened. There were 70, 70000, 70,000 people came up to Patriots Park, I guess they didn't call it that yet, but um, to recognize this great uh, event. Now I'm assuming I'm ignoring when it says Zoom hand has been raised. So I'm sure Chet is taking care of any raised hand. Um, so that event really to me uh, brings home the point that to me, the Westchester story is about the captors, about the militia. Um, and I know there's a lot of romanticizing of the story, but um, I think it's a great story about patriots who were yeoman farmers and uh, did their job as they should. Um, now, where do you go today? You go to Patriots Park and I can certainly hope for the next four years there are gonna be a lot of events in that park. But <clears throat> when you see that sign, if you said to somebody, hey, where's the, where's the, the, the monument to Andre? <laughs> You're gonna get in trouble in Terrytown. This is not a monument to Andre. It's to the captors. Um, so that was the quickest uh, trip through the spy, the traitor, and the captors. Uh, the, the next chapter, I'll try to go as quickly as I can here. The French connection, I call this. I don't think a lot of people know about this, but it, from 1781 to 1782, uh, a lot happened in Westchester with the relationship between the French army and, and, and Washington's army and the eventual victory at Yorktown. So here we go, what happened? Um, from Rhode Island, the French land, uh, their general is Rochambeau. Um, and he travels eventually from Rhode Island to Westchester, uh, Phillipsburg, the Phillipsburg encampment, they called it. The same time uh, Washington brings his army down um, and encamps across Westchester, about a mile away, his headquarters was by Ardsley High School, near Ardsley High School, um, and Rochambeau's headquarters, we will see what is uh, being restored there momentarily. Um, the French did great maps. Uh, we have a lot of this is another one. In fact, this is the one that was your uh, little promo uh, piece for this talk. The French uh, camped throughout Westchester and Washington camped throughout Westchester as they were trying to assess how they were going to defeat the British. 
when and where. Um, this will show you, uh, spoiler alert, they do not attack the British nearby in New York City where we know they are, but instead they cross most of their troops uh, back at Verplank's Point, Kings Ferry, um, and both armies cross, go, what is it, 600 miles down to Yorktown, Virginia, and are uh, victorious. Now you'll see there's Dobbs Ferry here on the map. Uh, there's Peekskill. You sometimes see uh, Terry Town on the map. You see Pines Bridge. Um, there certainly was no Irvington. There were like four tenant farmers. It's the place between Dobbs Ferry and Terrytown. But Dobbs Ferry did play a very special role and um, in this march to freedom. And it's there, it's a great uh, place to go when they have their march to freedom. And I, I know we need about an hour on Dobbs Ferry because so much happened there. I'll try to work in a little more of that story in a minute. But back to the Rochambeau headquarters, which I'm gonna show you the building. This is an imagined uh, meeting inside that uh, structure, that tenant farmhouse where Rochambeau on the left is talking to um, Washington on the right and they are reviewing a map. And what I think is great about this painting, you see the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and as it happened, by the time they have done a grand reconnaissance of the fortifications that the British have at their Northern boundary, back where you saw that dotted line in that map, they knew, they both knew, they could not attack the British there. And they also knew that the French Navy under de Grasse was not gonna come to New York, was gonna go to the Chesapeake and they had to get there out quickly and get down so that when the, the French Navy was there, they could have a successful battle and trap Cornwallis down there. Okay, so what can you see? Well, this was 1910. I guess most of us weren't there. That, this is the structure that is known as the Odell House Rochambeau headquarters. Here it is right now today. By the good luck and hard work of uh, friends of Odell House Rochambeau headquarters and the town of Greenberg and many other groups, this building is being restored. And it is my great hope that they will have this ready as a museum open to the public by 2026. And you can certainly keep in touch with Friends of Odell House Rochambeau headquarters. They are a great group. There's a little informational sign, but it is not opened yet to the public. Um, but what you can see around various sites related to the French connection are the, these um, signs that were put up, um, I'm gonna say like 2013, 2011 um, by the, it's, it's the trail, there's a national trail called the Washington Rochambeau National Heritage Trail. And there's a group called W3R. And these are groups that are, sh are showing where this great march that's from those 9,000 troops in Westchester when they, and they left here and they went to Yorktown, Virginia. This is in Dobbs Ferry, by the way. There are some great little, oops, sorry. Um, there we go. Other um, informational signs at the waterfront at Dobbs Ferry. Some of the troops crossed, one smaller unit crossed at Dobbs Ferry, all the rest of those, the, the artillery, the oxen, the, the horses, they all had to get across the Hudson, down all the way to Yorktown, Virginia. And they did. This is the route down here. Here's Yorktown, Virginia. Here is us, and here is where the French started from, from, uh, New, sorry, Newport, Rhode Island. Quite a feat. So we're not gonna have a big talk about the Battle of Yorktown, but I am gonna show you this little uh, drawing that a French officer made 
and he greatly admired Washington's army. And I, I particularly like this uh, because the Rhode Island Regiment that I told you about earlier that uh, sacrificed so much, um, sacrificed so much here was, uh, is depicted here in that little painting. So this is another beautiful place you can see when you, um, hang on a second, um, Kevin, can you close the door? Sorry, I have background noise. <laughs> um, this is old St. Peter's Church, gorgeous little place um, up by Burke Plagues Point. And this is the um, uh, painting that you can see up at Burke Plagues Point, a uh, very famous Trumbull painting. And, and this is Burke Plagues Point at his feet and his horse's feet. And this is an actual painting contemporary, contemporary to the time of that place for Planck's Point. It's a watercolor painting that was found several years ago, um, almost by accident. And the American the Museum of the American Revolution owns this. I saw it in the Historical Society in New York and it has got to come up to us. It's an incredible painting painting that shows you what Washington's, it's a little watercolor, it um, shows you what Washington's um, war tent looked like when it was set up in a context of the troops, and uh, I think it's really good. So there was a peace treaty, um, this is the quickest, <laughs> this is the quickest view of the eight years of war, but every, we know that the war was essentially over by the Battle of Yorktown, but Washington didn't know it was over. I mean, things could have happened. Meanwhile, John Jay, who is a Westchester guy, uh, his uh, childhood home in Rye, his retirement home here in Katona, this is a great, beautiful place to visit. Um, whoops. Um, and it's a state historic site. I think we will have a lot of great events there, not we, but they. Um, as we make our way to the 250th. Um, then finally, the peace treaty is done. The British have to leave. It's called evacuation day. They have to leave New York City, November 25th, very quickly. Washington leaves Newburgh, comes through Westchester, makes his way to New York and goes to Francis Tavern. <laughs> so I suggest you go there too. Uh, it's, it's a really uh, interesting place. A lot happened there. He said goodbye to his troops, the British left. And I just bring you back to um, Westchester to say, we didn't look at all our historic taverns on this tour, but we should. And I'm just gonna show you two of them. Um, the Square House in Rye, New York was a, a tavern, actually much of the war run by a woman and um, this is the Jug Tavern. It doesn't operate as a tavern now, but it's a beautiful building in Ossining, um, occasionally open for um, some, to the public for some events. And uh, the other thing, which is the end of the war, post-war, is our very famous other, um, I'm gonna call him a founding father. Maybe it's, uh, you know, a different use of the term, but, um, Obviously, uh, Paine wrote the famous common sense and the, you know, these are the time that tries men's souls. He was rewarded with about, I'm gonna say 200 acres of land and this cottage in New Rochelle, uh, often open now. Um, and there's also uh, at Iona College, the Institute of Thomas Paine studies with some really interesting things to see. So we've ended the war. <sighs> <laughs> We've done the eight years. That part of the talk is really over. Um, I, I'll just show you a very few slides of what we've been doing. Uh, we've been back before the pandemic. That was the top left. That's um, Phillips Manor Hall. Here we are at Kings Ferry. Down at the left, we're at St. Paul's. Ah, here I am with Benedict Arnold and uh, Major Andre. That was just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's up in Yorktown. Um, 
we've uh, we've been supporting as as best we can, publicizing the living history events. This one was at the Purdy House. I love these kids. Um, that's what I said was in Hastings. Um, and this was actually our Irvington Library. Um, uh, before the pandemic, one of our live presentations was about uh, fact and fiction in pop culture. So we talked about turn, you know, the TV show, what's fact and fiction. Um, and we have book groups. These are the scholarly books. Anybody can sign up for that. Our YouTube, our great YouTube, uh, who knew before the pandemic that YouTube was gonna be so important. That's where we put our energy during the pandemic. I'm so proud of these kids. We made three um, uh, videos. Uh, one of the Nodder historical, Nodder, he's on the Historical Society board, was our filmmaker. And uh, these kids were from Broadway Training Center and they narrate three minute videos. One's about Molly Dobbs Sneedon. One's about John Jack Peterson. He uh, was described as a mulatto. Um, we would say a person of color who uh, shot at that vulture, that ship that was supposed to take Andre. And there was another um, uh, hero, um, uh, Colonel Hurl Hurlbut, who was in Dobbs Ferry, went to Hastings. And, and you know that's a whole story. But you can see for three minutes, you can see all about it. And yeah, we've done some displays of what, what, what we do. And now we're starting a program in libraries, which our three libraries will know about now, where we will be able to help with the fees for bringing living history uh, programs to the libraries across Westchester. And I think that is the last one. <laughs> okay, you take it away, Chet. <laughs> Connie, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful presentation. Very, very interesting and, and very extensive and thorough. Um, we do have actually a couple of questions that if people put in the chat. And if people have additional questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. But I'm going to start going through some of them. You mentioned earlier in your presentation about the Miller House. And, uh, and the question is, I heard the Miller House isn't in its original location. Do you know where it was moved from? Okay, this is a great question because I happen to actually know this. The Purdy House was moved from its current location. The Miller House is in its current location. So the two that I showed, and they're both in White Plains and they're both tenant farm, originally tenant farm houses. That's you know what they were before they were in the middle of the Battle of White Plains or the war itself. But uh, it's like she's half right, whoever asked that. It wasn't the Miller house that moved. <laughs> okay, I have another question. And this is, just has to do about the everyday people who live here in Westchester. You described the true movements of troops and these battles going on. But this was the neutral ground. So what were everyday farmers? Were they just living and doing, living their lives, continuing to farm while these battles raged around them? Or how did it work? Yeah, well... Um, the a common phenom, as I have read about this, and I was really interested because RW two fifty is really interested in the unsung heroes, um, you know, and the the everyday lives, as the questioner obviously has uh, mentioned. The um, many families tried to move out. Um, their fences were taken for. Um, for fuel, their hogs were killed, their wheat was destroyed, uh, their houses were burned, they were hiding in cellars and trying to you know, escape the almost constant devastation because it wouldn't be a big battle, but there'd be a roving gang who would come and for retribution would be going after, say the, the Romer Van Tassel house in Elmsford, I mean, there was an attack there. Um, and then there was another, you know, attack, you know, to get back at them. So if you stayed, um, your life was in danger. Um, 
if you left, your farm was probably destroyed. And there were some French uh, officers who wrote about this and they said, it, it, it's like a devastation. The trees are gone, the, farm, the, farm, uh, the farms are destroyed. So people were barely, I mean, you know, in an odd way, when I look at what happens in, in the Ukraine right now, it, it makes me think of, of what that was like. And if people came back and made their lives and bought the, you know, the land and here we are. So it was a total war um, in a way that we now, we know in the modern age. So here's a question about the um, Andre capture. Uh, I've read that perhaps the guys who captured Andre were not exactly upstanding individuals and may have asked for bribes instead of Andre offering them. Do you know anything about that? I have read extensively about this, but I would, I would defer to the research that you can learn from the, um, the Historical Society uh, of Terrytown and Sleepy Hollow. They uh, have really uh, delved into this and there are so many books and so much um, you know, not, it's like the story changes as the decades go by, but my, I'm big on the, what is the preponderance of evidence and the preponderance of evidence as I can ascertain um, is that they, they would benefit from uh, goods. That, I mean, if they had taken cattle, they would have gotten, that was the arrangement the militias had. They, the individuals did get some reward, but I'd say they, they did their job, they followed their rules, and they did not um, ask for a bribe. So they got, they, they turned down the, the, the rewards and money, they turned down, I think it was a watch, you know, so that's, that's the way I read it right now. But history, you know, you get new evidence, you find information, original sources, and sometimes, you know, your perspective changes. Okay. Um, you mentioned that Washington crossed the Hudson River at Verplanck's Point during his retreat to New Jersey. Did he cross with a flotilla of boats like the, in the Delaware crossing, in addition to using the existing King's Ferry? And is Verplanck's Point located in Peekskill? Um, okay, so um, I I don't know I don't know exactly about the nature of the uh, water uh, ships boats. I think from what I uh, what I am best remembering of things I read about, and there have been recreations of this. There are folks at West Point who can really tell you the details of this. Um, there were a very simple uh, low boats, kind of like what you might have seen in those pictures of crossing the Delaware. Um, every kind of um, way in which the horses could swim, but the boats, there were many, many boats. So they didn't re rely on a ferry per se. And what was the second half of that? So the question is, is Verplank located in Peekskill? Yes, right. no. And it fits in the south of Peekskill. Right, it's right, exactly. It's not in peak skill. Okay. So here's another question. Um, what do you consider the most at-risk site relating to our revolutionary history here in Westchester that deserves our attention? Ooh, well, buildings that are in private hands, um, you know, if they're, well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to, to know how you, how you deal with that, but, um, I'd, I'd love it if everybody who actually owns, I mean, property that uh, relates to this, you know, would just think about the public and how it would be a, a you know, a positive for, for the public to be able to be aware of them more. But, um, well, I guess right now I would say that um, we need to put effort into that Odell House Rochambeau headquarters because I feel like that will, that will help tell the story about the French, which is so under, un, un, less understood of the importance of that alliance between the French and, the, and Washington. I mean, can you imagine us really actually beating 
the British without the French. So telling that story and so much of the decisions happened here and probably happened right in that Hartsdale Ridge Road building that I would say to me, that would be a great, great help uh, to have that. Okay, um, next question. What happened to Benedict Arnold? Oh yeah, well, he made, it, he made it to Great Britain. He managed to get his barge to the vulture, even though the vulture had moved. And he, he escaped, um, went to New York City, became a general in the British army. And, you know, he even came back to Connecticut, his hometown and, um, you know, fought against, <laughs> the Patriots there. So he went to Great Britain and uh, he didn't he didn't get all the recognition and he didn't uh, that he, he wanted, but that's, so he survived and Andre <laughs> didn't. <laughs> hey, here's a question. I don't know if you know the answer to this. Belden Avenue and Dobbs Ferry has many renovated homes that resemble this area, the old area. Oh yeah, I know Belden. And, and it's the, Questioners is I believe they received a huge grant. Is there a historical connection to this area and the Revolutionary War? Uh, we might have a Dobbs Ferry person, but my uh, tours around Dobbs Ferry uh, haven't included Belden. Um, I think those are they're beautiful, but I would say they're 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 later than the Revolutionary places. That the places that are um, oldest in um, in Dobbs, you know, we we stood. Um, oh, I guess it's you know when you go sharply down to go to what was the chart house. I guess it's something different. I don't remember the name now. Uh, you can see where where some of those older buildings would have been, and where the redoubts are from the uh, Revolution, where they built up fortifications with earth. Uh, so I don't think Belden is connected in any way to the revolution, but I defer. <laughs> okay, um, here's a question. Um, this coming summer, if they someone wants to find out about reenactments and living history locations, where should they go to? What is, should they go to the RW250 website or other places they should go to find out about these kinds of events? Well, uh, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I, we try, we being RW250, we have a very active um, Facebook page and we try to report on that, um, what we know that other groups are doing. Obviously, if we're holding an event, we, or you know, like this talk, we, we promoted it just like uh, the Irvington Historical Society promoted this talk. But if we're not running it and we don't know about it, then it's, we often find out later and go, <clears throat> how come they didn't tell us? We could have told people about this talk, an author or a living history thing. But we hope that all these partner groups will begin to see that we, can do a public service. I mean, we're a nonprofit um, by publicizing events. We like to publicize events that are free and open to the public. We feel a little funny about publicizing things that you have to pay for, but you know, I don't know how that'll develop. But all the state historic sites, the two in Westchester, John Jay Homestead, Phillips Manor Hall, you can be on their mailing list. You can certainly um, be on the mailing list of the Westchester County Historical Society. They send out messages. Uh, so I think, um, you know, those, that would be my advice at this point, or, you know, it's, there is no absolute clearinghouse that everybody has to report what they're doing. Okay, I think we're gonna have one more question. And this is a kind of a, a kind of a precise question about the three captors who, who captured Andre. Um, someone writes that she understands that Williams Van Hort and Paulding had actually escaped from the Sugar House prison, which the British had maintained in New York City. And that at the time when they stumbled onto Andre, one was wearing a Hessian coat. And when they came across Andre, Andre thought they were friendly and bragged at the time that he was actually hiding the plans to West Point. 
Do you know if there's any truth to that yeah, story? Yeah, I, I know a bit about that. Um, and, you know, it was one, uh, it was John Paulding who had the Hessian jacket, um, not all three of them. And yes, he had been in the sugar house uh, in that prison and he had escaped just really quite recently before that event. Um, which also speaks to the fact that people didn't have like 10 jackets to choose from. Uh, having, having, a, having a jacket, you know, was probably all he had. That was the only jacket he had, um, likely. But um, he, um, he is the one that did it. And, and yes, we, we have a preponderance of evidence that Andre thought they were friendly by the, looking at that jacket. And he spilled the beans in a way and said, oh yeah, hey, I found my friendly British folks. He didn't say that, but essentially they understood. And then he went, what? <laughs> and so he kind of, um, I don't think he was a very good spy. <laughs> I, I think he really, uh, you know, he, he, he could have done his job better, but thankfully, if, you know, if you believe that our cause uh, the find, founding this nation was a good idea, then you'll thank them for uh, being astute and thank him for not being the best spy he could be. Okay, I think at this point, I'm gonna ask uh, Veronica if she could maybe just come turn her camera back on and just say a, a few closing comments. That would be just wonderful, thanks. Hi, everybody. Cutting, thank you so much. That was great. Really, really great visuals. Uh, I think we all appreciated it.